What's up, everybody? Welcome to tonight's webinar. And, and here's the thing. Tonight, you're going to learn something so important, but actually something that a lot of people would say is boring. But boring is good. And I'm going to open up tonight by telling you what you're going to learn. You're going to learn about something called asset protection. But really, you're going to learn about long-term care insurance. But you're going to see it done in a completely different way than you've ever seen. So being a financial advisor from 2003 to 18, we did a lot of long-term care. And it was probably one of the least important things people were thinking about because we don't ever want to think about the day where we can't wipe ourselves, we can't bathe ourselves, we can't dress ourselves, we can't eat on our own. We don't want to think about that day. But the fact of the matter is, is you got a much better chance of that happening than you dying. Because I know, I know we go through life just thinking, oh, you know what? I'm going to get old and I'm just going to die and nobody's, I'm not going to be anybody's problem. But that isn't the case. And with the, the whole population aging, baby boomers kind of getting to that point where they're starting to, like some of them are starting to have these issues, the silent generation absolutely having these issues. I want to start with a story. And the story comes to my own personal experience. Now, I was a young boy when this happened, but I remember it like it was yesterday. It was my grandmother, my mom's grandma, okay? So mom's dad's mom. Anyway, I don't know why I had to explain that. So grandma was awesome. I'd always go over there for cookies and milk, and it was such a great childhood experience, but grandma got older. And I remember there was a time grandma fell down the stairs. She broke her hip, and she went to the hospital, got her hip fixed, went through all the rehab, but she could never get back up and down the stairs. So we had to make a decision as a family to give, you know, put her in a home. Now, that isn't such a bad thing. She, she had to go to a facility. I don't want to say a home, but she had to go to a facility. But in the beginning, she had assets. She had, a, I can't remember, a little over $100,000 in cash. So she was able to buy herself into whatever facility. So she interviewed a bunch of places, found one she loved. It was an assisted living facility where she had friends and she built a bunch of relationships. And I remember going to visit her there. She was so happy. She wasn't alone. She had the help where she needed help. She didn't have to walk up and down stairs. And all was great until she ran out of money. My grandmother spent through all of her money. And I remember my family even made the decision to sell her house so that they could keep her in that facility because she enjoyed it so much. But when they sold her house, I can't remember what they got. It wasn't a ton. That went really quick. And I remember the point where my mom told me that grandma had to move. And she moved into this other facility. But you see, she was no longer paying. The government, the state was paying. Medicaid was paying for her to stay at this place. So she wasn't in a nice assisted living facility with all of her friends. She was in a place that I, all I can describe, and I only went there twice, and this is sad, so please don't like take this the wrong way, folks. But when I walked in the facility, it just reeked of, re of urine. And I remember the second time I went to see grandma there, she literally was complaining that she was, in, she was laying in her own pee and had been for several hours. This is the reality, folks. You see, grandma ran out of money to be able to pay for the facility she wanted to be in. And my grandma ended up dying in that facility. That, that was the last place that she was able to go. And unfortunately, this isn't just my grandma's story. This is so many other people's stories. This is actually a pretty normal story because normally how it goes is, you know, we get older, we get frail, we start not being able to do everything. So best case scenario, you're married, so your spouse starts taking care of you. But eventually, they get to a point where they can't do it anymore because they just can't. Mentally, physically, they might be a little older, too. So then all of a sudden, what happens? Well, the children come in and start caring for the parents. But I don't know. In today's society, how many children have the time to go care for grandma or for mom and dad? We're all working hard. We're working a lot, right? Well, what are we going to do? Quit our job? We gonna just take time off of our job if they'll give it to us? Probably not. So the fact of the matter is, we have some decisions to make. Now, I'm 46, I've already made this decision, but I didn't just make the decision for me, I made the decision for my mom a while ago. I think it was 2007, if I'm not mistaken. I made the decision to buy long-term care insurance, one of the old policies that were monthly pay. I bought one of those policies on my mom. And I didn't do it because my mom has assets to protect. My mom doesn't really have anything. She has the house, and that's about it. It wasn't the assets I was trying to protect for mom. It was the standard of living. I remembered what happened to grandma, and I don't ever want my mom 
to ever have to be put into a facility like that because the state and it will Medicaid. I'm, I'm not going to pick on state or fed. Medicaid says this is where you are going to be. That will never happen for my mom. Her long term care policy is expensive. I pay it every single month for her. And the best part about it is there's a tax advantage for doing that. But not only do I pay for my mom's long term care, I'm happy to write that check. Because when that day comes where mom needs a little extra help, I can pick and choose anywhere I want because her budget at that time, because it was indexed for inflation for all these years, will be pretty big. She'll pretty much be able to pick and choose where she wants to go, how she wants to be cared for. But you know what my mom's going to decide? Then, and folks, I want you to listen to this closely. My mom's going to decide she wants to stay in her home and she wants a nurse to come to the house and care for her there. And the best part about it is she can do that because she has control. She writes the rules. She doesn't need the government or the state to make the rules for her. She writes the rules because of planning. Because we made a decision many years ago to make sure that my mom would be in control of that decision. I'm making that decision to make sure I will be in control of that situation someday when somebody else has got to wipe my butt. I mean, let's be real about it. That's what it's going to be. I'm going to have the decision to have anyone I want wipe my butt. But with that little funny little tidbit, I'm going to turn this over to the expert, Michelle, to explain how this works, because it's a very different game in the long-term care world today than it was back when I bought my mom's and back when my grandma went through hers. And the controls and the ways you can have control without having to have this big monthly premium check you got to write, the rules have changed there as well. So Michelle, welcome. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, first of all, mic drop, we can stop. I think you just covered it so well, so eloquently. What I have heard for the past 26 years in being in the long-term care industry. And what I've done is I've taught financial professionals throughout the country how to do this properly, how to set things up, what options people have available to them. Because the good news is the younger and healthier you are, the more options you have. Once we get older and we become more frail, then, then our options are limited. And you mentioned it. Uh, it would be state aid uh, once we get to a certain point and we burn through assets. So um, thank you so much for allowing me to join on this. I, I, I hope that I'm going to change the way that people think about this and view this. Uh, I'll have some some funny, I, I've had a couple of uh, shots of espresso, so y'all need to hang with me because it's going to get a little entertaining. Uh, just laugh at my corny jokes, pretend like they're funny, Chris, just to keep me kind of going. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Give me just a moment. All right. So I like to call this defend against the financial storms because we have seen this so, so many times that people do everything that they were taught and told to do. They listen to their, their financial pro and, and their financial pro says, do this and do that. And they do all the right things. And then something blows a hole right in the side of any good solid plan. And, and they're left to, to kind of figure it out on their own. So let's first, I wanna go over the agenda and what I'm gonna cover with, and Chris, you're gonna to have to jump in there uh, from time to time, because I get really excited about this. You said long-term care was boring. I don't find it boring. I find it well, boring. Well, that's good. <laughs> so good, good. So um, we're gonna talk about what are the things that could break? What if expenses suddenly skyrocketed? What would cause that to happen? And then most importantly, and man, it just, it, it, it blessed me when you said this, what about your parent? Have you parent-proofed your plan? So not only were you able to do that for your mom, but you did it for yourself too. You're now protecting your lifestyle, your spouse's lifestyle, your, your child's lifestyle, because you're now able to hire the pros to do that. Still make sure mom's taken care of, but you're still able to do what you need to do as far as your marriage, your, your business, your, you know, being a, being a parent yourself. So what we're going to do is I have to first cover what is long-term care, because there's a lot of folks out there that have misconceptions about what long-term care is. And most people automatically think nursing home because that's been our experience. You mentioned it yourself. Both of my grandparents were in a nursing facility and I smelled the same thing, Chris. I don't want to, I don't want to be there and I don't want to put my parents there. We're gonna go over some facts and figures. I wanna make sure everybody understands what they're going to be looking at you know, now and into the future. Uh, we're gonna talk about the impact on families, but we're also gonna talk about the impact on finances. So this is a double-edged sword. There's the, this emotional side to this with our families, but man, there's a logic side and it just, it comes down to money and how we're gonna pay for this. And then I'm gonna show you some examples of what, are, what some options are uh, that are available to you in the marketplace. 
So first of all, what is long-term care? Oftentimes you might hear of it as custodial care, long-term care, or extended health care. It's all the same thing. We just have different names for it. But it's not necessarily a nursing home. It could be cared for at home, which we really saw that skyrocket in COVID. Uh, most people didn't want to put their parents in a facility or, or their loved ones in a facility and then have you know, regulated hours or have to wave to them you know, through the glass. They wanted them to be at home as much as possible. Facility care, of course, informal care, meaning family members might take care of them, neighbors might take care of them, and then many different uh, other things. Adult day care, I think I mentioned that as well. And what we're talking about here is things that we're going to need help with on a daily basis, just our activities of daily life, things that we would do, getting in and out of bed, taking a shower, using the restroom, eating, all those types of things. Now, here's what I want to show you. This, this usually shocks folks. So this is what uh, the costs are currently the national average. Some areas are less, some areas are more. Again, I'm just going to show the national average so that people can get a good feel of what it is. And usually the coasts are going to be more expensive. So the East Coast and the West Coast, us here in the middle, I'm in Indiana, uh, we're about the national average. So least expensive to the most expensive. So first thing is adult daycare. So this is going to run you about $25,000 a year. If you are taking care of your parent, you need to drop them off because they're not able to stay by themselves during the day while you're working. It's gonna cost you about 25 grand a year. Next would be assisted living facility. My good friend down in Texas says you can swing a dead cat and hit an assisted living facility because they're popping up on every corner. And the reason is the baby boomer generation. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So that's about $64,000 a year. Next would be a home health care aid. So if I'm gonna hire someone to come in my home and help me, um, you know, just throughout the day, uh, that's going to be about 75000 Now, notice I put an asterisk here, and the reason is this is for 40 hours per week. So once we see people start needing care for more than 40 hours a week, that's when we start to see people transition into a nursing facility because it's actually a cost savings, believe it or not. If you would like to share a room with a complete stranger about the size of my office here, that's going to cost you about $104,000 per year. And if you're privileged enough and you've done the proper planning and you can afford to pay for a private room, it's going to cost you about $116,000 a year. And like I said, on the coast, I've seen it as high as $200,000 a year uh, and it's rising. So I know this is probably a shock to a lot of people thinking, holy cow, how on earth am I going to pay for this? But there's more coming. So this is just for one year of needing care. The average length of care is not one year. The average length of care for all you males out there is about 2.2 years. This is the average. For females, the average is about 3.7 years. And the average length of care right now for Alzheimer's is eight years. How do we get an average? Averages really don't tell the whole story, the whole truth. The way that I come up with averages is a high and a low. We come up with something in the middle, or as I like to uh, humorously described to clients, if I'm standing in a bucket of ice water and my hair is on fire, on average, I would be comfortable. Of course, I'm not comfortable. My hair is on fire. So what we're talking about when we show these averages, we're really talking about what's going to be comfortable. We're not talking about worst case scenario. And it's really the worst case scenario that, that tends to wipe people out. If we just told clients that, hey, you need to say for one or two years of this, uh, oftentimes people could do that. They would put that money aside, but we'll talk about here in just a moment. We don't know how long it's going to be. We'll dive into that in a moment. Now, this is a really interesting survey that was done. So there's a company down here. There's a public website, AALTCI. If you want to dive into more of this detail, if you need like uh, literature to fall asleep at night, this is an excellent place. I'm kidding, of course, because I'm talking about long-term care. But if you want to know a little bit more, this is an excellent place to go but they had conducted a study of the seven largest long-term care insurance companies. And they simply asked them, what is your longest claim for your male client? And what is your longest claim for your female client? And here's what they came back with. Company number one, 14 years, 16 years for the female, 19 years for the man, 15 years for the female on down the line. Check this out, $2 million, $2.3, $2.6 million is what they had spent. Now, what was eye-opening to me uh, and it really was, especially I've spent my the majority of my career in this industry, we really got three things from the survey. Number one, what we can assume because of the length of care that these people most likely had some kind of a cognitive issue, something like a dementia or an Alzheimer's, those tend to last very long because it's 
It's our brains that are not allowing us to do the things we need to do, but maybe our bodies are still strong and healthy. So they haven't given out on us yet. So that's number one. We can assume that these folks most likely had some kind of a Parkinson's, dementia, Alzheimer's. Number two, what we can also assume is that these companies had sold them some type of an unlimited benefit. Oftentimes in the industry, you might see anywhere from three to six years uh, in coverage that, that a lot of companies are offering. The, these companies most likely offered an unlimited benefit, meaning however long you need care, this money is just going to keep on kicking out and keep on paying. The third thing that was really eye-opening to me, and Chris, I hope this kind of shocks you too, is that when it came to the length of care, it didn't matter what the gender was. I just showed you a moment ago, 2.2 years for females, 3.7, excuse me, for males, 3.7 for females. But check this out. Five of the seven, the man met or exceeded what the female needed. And that's that shocked us. Because yeah, that's most, totally most, against what we've been taught. We always thought men, we don't right. live as long. Well, and again, when it comes to a cognitive, now we've taken the, the, the body part out of it, right? Because the body is what makes men, you know, pass away sooner than, than the females. But when it's a cognitive issue, we've found that this is, it's the same. It really doesn't matter what your gender is. So we need to, because I did the same thing, Chris. Uh, I would talk to a, a single male and I'd go, eh, you're good with, you know, maybe five or six years of coverage. You, sh you should be, uh, you should have uh, an adequate amount of, of coverage there but this proved us wrong. And so I, I take that back. All right, let's move forward. Now, there are some trends that we are watching very closely. We're paying very close attention to this. And I, I would assume that many of you that are listening to this call have probably witnessed some of these things yourself. So let me share these trends with you because these trends will and should have a huge impact on the cost of care. So number one is just the pure number of people that will be needing care pretty much all at the same time. Right now, we call that group the baby boomer generation. Uh, 10,000 people every day this year are turning 78. Now, there's 20 years of those folks following right behind them. Here's the deal. The majority of these baby boomers, they're not yet needing care. This is going to happen in the next five to seven years that we see a big wave of this, which again is why we're building so many facilities, uh, because we, we've got to have you know, a place for people to go for care. So right now, it's just the pure number of people. We know what supply and demand works. If there's a high demand and there's not enough supply, that will, of course, jack up those costs. So the silver tsunami is coming, and we all have to be prepared for that. Number two is medical technology. Medical technology has done great things for our bodies. They haven't fixed our minds. So we've seen an increase in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and dementia and those types of illnesses, as I just showed you, require a much longer period of time. So what I tell people, because I hear this a lot, Michelle, I'm healthy. I don't need this. I tell them, you're the problem. Stop exercising, eat bacon, start smoking cigarettes. Like, I'm kidding, of course. I'm In moderation, I do like bacon. <laughs> Drink like a fish. But we, we have created a new issue. Uh, there's a saying out there, the solution to one problem is the creation of a new problem. And we've seen that through medical technology, through better knowledge about our health, now we're living longer and we have to prepare for it. Number three is the family dynamics. Kids aren't necessarily sticking around to take care of mom and dad. They move away. Maybe they went to college and stayed. Maybe they got married and moved away. Uh, we've seen a big outsourcing for mom and dad's care. And a lot of it's just because families don't live in the same community anymore. And then point four, believe it or not, is our government. That is a trend. Now, regardless of how we may feel politically, I'm sure we all have our opinions there, especially here lately. The, the thing about government is it always changes. So what they have available today may or may not be available 10, 15, 20 years down the line. We just don't know what it's going to look like, but I promise you it will change and it's continued to do that. So these four trends, the number of people, how long we're living, who's providing care and who's paying for it will and should have a huge impact. Uh, on those costs. So I'm going to show you my last set of stats, and, and this is probably going to shock you a little bit. 70% of our American population will require this kind of care at some point in the future. Now, 20% will require it longer than, than uh, five years, but we're talking about 70% of our population, 70% of the people on this call here tonight will require some kind of help in the future. Here's the problem. Most people believe they're the 30%, right? It's never gonna happen to me. 
going to happen to you, Chris, but it's not going to happen to me. And why do I say that? I have heard so many excuses in the past 26 years. I've heard, I, I told you a moment ago, Michelle, I'm healthy. I don't need this. Um, I've heard, Michelle, I will shoot myself. This is a very popular response. Um, that's a sensitive subject, of course, but, but it's, 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 it is factual that people say these things. Michelle, it's funny you mentioned that. Somebody had mentioned how easy it is to drown in five feet of water. And, but I mean, that is definitely, that is a rebuttal that you hear a lot. Absolutely, Chris. And, you know, it's interesting because um, when we talk about like planning for income throughout your retirement years, clients will go, well, yeah, 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 I plan for, you know, 90. And I go, okay, well, you need long-term care. Oh, no, 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 I'll die in my 50s. It's amazing how they will immediately change what they think about because they want to deflect. This is not something what they want to talk about. And I'll share with you uh, what my own father said. My dad said, Michelle, if it happens, we'll pray about it. And I said, well, dad, who do you think sent me here to tell you to do this? I thought that was pretty clear, but he knows I'm a smart aleck. And so he, he got mad at me when I said that. But nonetheless, we know this is an issue, but rather than trying to convince someone it's going to be them someday, you know, Chris, you got up this morning, you brushed your own teeth, you, you brushed your hair, you got dressed. We really do take this for granted that we're able to care for ourselves until we can't anymore. So here's my first question. I want to ask everyone in the audience today, you know, really think about these. I'm going to ask you two questions. This is the first one. The first question is, look, it, it may not happen to you. You might be the 30%. But what if you did need care? How will it affect your family? How will it affect the people around you? The people that you swore you would provide and protect? How does it impact them? And by asking this simple conversation or the simple question, what, I, what I've been able to do is kind of shift people into thinking about other people instead of themselves or being in a nursing home or someone taking care of them. They really do start thinking about what happens to my spouse? What happens to my, my children? What happens to their life? So we're going to dive into that just a little bit. So the first one that happens is there's an impact on spouses. There are obviously emotional impacts. There are physical challenges, financial impacts. So I am, we're going to, I said, I've been doing this for 26 years. So me saying I'm 29 is probably not going to pass, but I'm young and healthy right now. I can't pick my husband up now. I can't imagine being 80 and frail and doing it, but yet somehow spouses do it all the time, but it will take its toll. It will have its impact. Uh, an emotional impact. I, I feel a, a sense of loss of a life that we used to have when we used to be active in the community and going out and traveling and doing things. And then, of course, the financial impact. If I have to pay extra money for you know, upwards of $100,000 a year for him to be cared for, what does that do to my retirement? What does that do to my plan? What does that do to my banking strategy? What does that do to my wealth, my generational wealth planning? What, what kind of impact does that have? What about caregiving children? Uh, Chris talked about it a, a few moments ago when he opened up. Like, if I'm going to, I'm the only daughter out of my family, I have brothers. Uh, if, if this will happen to me, this will fall on my shoulders, but I'm, I'm married. I have my own children. Hopefully, uh, you know, God willing, I'll have some grandchildren someday, but I'm still at the height of my career where I'm traveling. I'm doing all kinds of things. I do speaking engagements like I'm doing right here with you. So if I have to take care of my, my parents, what does that mean for my lifestyle? Do I have to take a step back in my career? Do I have to quit my job, which impacts my retirement plan, my generational wealth, my banking strategy? It, it impacts everything that I was on track to accomplish. And of course, um, you know, nobody wants their, their child to give up on those types of dreams and aspirations in their life. I know it would crush my dad if he knew that he was the reason I didn't get to fulfill my dreams and my purpose here on this earth. What about adult, adult siblings? Chris, do you have, do you have brothers or sisters? Yeah, I have uh, one half sister. Do you agree on everything? But no. I don't, this gets worse. So I don't agree with my, I would not leave my brothers with my cat, let alone my parents. So it, this is where we start to see tension and resentment pop up in families. Because maybe, you know, maybe Chris, maybe your sister's spending all the time taking care of your mom, your dad. And she goes, hey, I need you to get your hiney over here. Help me with mom. And you go, hey, I, I got this webinar. I got to be on. I can't be there. Well, now she's getting mad at you because you're not there and she wants you there. So we start to see this. Some families can work it out, but oftentimes we see this start to rip families apart. There's a saying in the industry, 
um, someone dying brings families together, but someone needing care can rip them apart. And I'm sure, hey, if you're out there and you have witnessed this in your own family, put something in the chat and, and let us know because we see this across the board. And then of course, what if, what if you're single? What if you've moved away? What if you retired down to Florida but all your family's up in Michigan? What are you gonna do then? We need to make sure that someone is close by to advocate for you. We need to make sure that there's plans in place. So again, the first question is, how will it impact your family? And here's the second question. And if you did need care, how will you pay for it? It's a, it's a pretty straightforward question. And I showed you a few moments ago, it's not free and it's not cheap. It's pretty salty. So when I ask people, what, how will they pay for it? I typically get three answers. The first one is taxpayer assistance. Hey, Michelle, yeah, I paid into the government. They'll pay for me. And there are some differences between Medicare and Medicaid. And I want to touch on those briefly. It's a lot, but I'm going to try to touch on those briefly. Medicare is health insurance. So oftentimes people will confuse it because Medicare will pay for a small portion of nursing home, but it's following a hospital stay meant to be rehabilitative. I just had a hip replacement. I had my knee replaced. I have to rehabilitate before I move back out in the community. What we're talking about would be Medicaid. And what do you have to get? What do you have to be to get on Medicaid? You've got to be broke. Uh, you've got to be impoverished. That's the intent of it. And I I love America. I am a proud American, family full of veterans. I was born on a military base. Uh, I am so thankful that we live in a country that we take care of people that can't take care of themselves. That being said, there's a lot of people that end up on that program that ought not be. And it's because nobody told them that they had options when they were younger and healthier. And this is a crisis mode. And so they're spending down because there is no other option. So I don't know about you. I don't work. I didn't work as hard as I have my entire life to end up trying to rely on, on taxpayer assistance. I want to take care of myself and I want options. I want choice. Chris, what do you think about that? Have you seen people needing that? Well, I, I think a lot of people don't really understand how the, the government or the state's gonna pay for their care. So a lot of people I think think, I know my mother did, that Medicare is gonna just pay for their care. Can you can you just quickly just mention how long Medicare is gonna pay for your care before you gotta to go to Medicaid and spend all your assets down to, I don't mean to say this the wrong way, but a poverty level? Yeah, so um, the first uh, 20 days is paid for by Medicare, and then from 20 to 100 is partially paid. It's very small that they pay, and then you're on your own. But remember, it's following a hospital stay because it's designed to be a different type of care not custodial care, it's a skilled care. I need skilled care because of the rehabilitation. And uh, like I said, most people don't want this as an option. They just don't know that they have other options available to them. Yeah, I remember when I was getting my CLTC way back when, that was one of the biggest struggles I had is the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. And I, I really didn't understand until I went through that. And then I fully understood it. And then I really got familiar with how Medicaid works. And you don't get Medicaid, until you literally spend everything you've pretty much made. And, and and when it's a husband, wife situation, like that's a really sad scenario, what they do there. Yeah, it really is. Um, now, if you are the surviving spouse, maybe not as bad, but gosh, if you're still, they call them the community spouse, I still live within the community and my spouse needs the help. They, You really do have to spend down so much and they give you so such a small amount of income to live on. Um, you had mentioned a moment ago, um, you know, the government, you know, doesn't know how they're going to pay. They don't know how they're going to pay for it. And here's what's happening. Medicaid is mostly funded by the states. States can't print money. So states have to come up with a budget and the bulk of their budget is Medicaid. And so what we have seen in the last couple of years, because they're strapped, they are scared, they are concerned. I believe the last count was 12 states have considered enacting additional taxation. Love that, I love taxes, no I don't. They're pursuing additional taxation. We saw it happen in the state of Washington where they're doing a payroll tax. If you are a W-2 employee, I don't care if you work at Burger King and you're 16, you're paying this tax. And it, it, it really, the benefits were, were just a joke. It's gone through litigation. We'll see if they actually implement it. Uh, California's pursuing something. It's really been tough, but it's coming to a state near you because again, states are, they are strapped. And so they can't just print money in order to pay for this issue. All right. Number two, traditional long-term care insurance. Chris, this is what you were talking about with your mom. 
So that I applaud anyone who has bought or sold a traditional long-term care insurance policy because it's appropriate to transfer risk to an insurance company to leverage your, make your pennies work like dollars. That is, that is a big deal. But we know that there's been some issues with that type of insurance because it's kind of like how we feel about car insurance or homeowner's insurance. I make the payment, but if I if nothing happens, I, I feel like I've wasted that money. So it's not been a great motivator for people to put plans in place because they feel that it's a use it or lose it policy. And for some it has been, but gosh, for some it's been a saving grace. So I, again, anybody that has this, it's a great thing. But in the recent years, in the past probably 10 years, there's been uh, fewer and fewer people buying this type of policy. This is the big one. They say, I'll pay out of pocket. Now they either do it out of default, as I mentioned a moment ago, they didn't do anything about it. Nobody told them anything about it. They didn't get the education. So here we go, let's just see how long it lasts. Or they do it by choice. And when I say by choice is, some people will choose to pay for it out of pocket. They are told by their attorney or their CPA, look, Chris, you got plenty of money. You can just self-pay. You do not have to uh, buy insurance for this. And I just, I shake my head at that because last year I had two surgeries. I'm fine, nothing, nothing, not a big deal. But those surgeries cost me $300,000. I'm thankful I had health insurance at the time because I paid a $7,000 deductible and I got $300,000 worth of bills paid. I Could I have paid for it? Yeah, I, I, I could have through retirement, through other uh, you know uh, real estate and things like that. But why would I want to? Why on earth would I want to pay retail dollar for anything? That is not how we build wealth, right? I mean, we buy things pennies on the dollar. I buy real estate properties really cheap, I leverage them out and then I sell them for a larger, that's the name of the game. You buy low and you sell high. I don't understand why a, a trusted advisor would tell a client, go it alone and just pay for it out of pocket because there's a ripple effect to that. I don't know what the market's going to look like. Am I going to sell my real estate at an inopportune time? We'll, we'll kind of dive into that a little bit further. So I always recommend if you're going to self-fund Let's find a better way to self-fund and let's use tax-free money to do it. I love tax-free. It's my favorite word. If I had a third kid, I'd name it tax-free prather. I love it so much. I'm kidding. All right. So what kind of impact do we have? Well, so we're going to talk about income and this is the issue. So this is an income problem. So oftentimes people talk about long-term care insurance. I call it long-term care income because this is a cash flow issue. So it's not a one-time payment. I mentioned that earlier. This is a bill. This is now a new bill on top of what I'm already spending. So let's say in retirement, I'm living frugal. I'm just going to use round numbers. I'm living on $100,000 a year, but boom, I now have a new bill and it's another $100,000 a year. Where do I get the extra hundred to fill that gap? This is the great income gap. This is the issue that we're going to be facing because we get into what we call death spiral. We start selling things at, at the wrong time. We start cashing in other life policies. Our bank, we have banking uh, strategies set in place for a reason, and this is not one of them. We wanna leave that intact. We want our life insurance intact. Whatever our retirement plan is, our real estate, that is put in place for a reason. We need cash flow to kick in and start paying those bills. And I prefer it to be tax-free. So. If we have assets, I mentioned a moment ago, what happens there? Well, it leaves my spouse with a retirement lifestyle less than desirable. That's not what we had planned. Maybe I leave my children without an inheritance. There's a higher withdrawal rate. Uh, the, the government sees it. If, if you've got qualified money out there and you start pulling money out of those retirement accounts, the government sees that as more taxation. So they're gonna throw you in a higher tax bracket. And oh, by the way, if you're in your Medicare years, they're gonna increase your Medicare premiums too. So there's just this ripple effect of not having proper plans and preferably income tax-free. So I call what I'm about to show you invisible income. I call it invisible income because the government doesn't see it as income. Income from insurance sources in this case is not going to be taxable. So long-term care, it's an income problem, not an asset problem. How much income are my assets able to generate at the exact moment? I got to turn that thing on and start shooting that out. So Chris, have you heard it like this before as an income or a cash flow problem? Paying a of monthly course. Yeah, I mean, you know, the one I did for my mom, that one I just pay monthly. But I, I will tell you one thing you didn't mention is, you know, a lot of those old long-term care plans, the way they were sold, the insurance companies kind of under 
calculated the premium. So I've had two rate increases on mine, which definitely creates a little bit of a, an income problem. I mean, luckily I have the means to pay for it, but a lot of people, you know, they they get to a point with, especially with like some of the old, um, I don't remember if it was John Hancock or that, but they, they increased the rates so much that a lot of people just lapse the policies. Yeah. Sorry if I'm missing the, 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 the mark of the income problem, but that was something that also I was honing in on when you were talking about it. No, that's good, Chris. And you're right. So there was a perfect storm when that happened. So the insurance companies not only didn't calculate the, the what we call morbidity, they didn't calculate the claims, how many people were going to use it at the same time that the interest rates tanked. And so they didn't have they didn't have this in their general accounts. What I'm going to show you, that's never going to be an issue because we use whole life insurance. And as you know, that's the rock solid way to go. Ironclad guarantees. You never have to worry about that. So we'll go into that in detail here in just a moment. So let's go back a step. So the government recognized this was gonna be a huge issue. So they said, look, we are going to do something about this via taxation. And by the way, that's how they help us with our behavior. They'll raise taxes to keep us from doing stuff like cigarettes and apparently driving. And then they will lower taxes to encourage us to go in that direction. It's, it's a fantastic way to get people to move where you want them to move. And so what they said is, look, we're." We're going to put this on the backs of life insurance companies. These life insurance policies are going to be paid out eventually anyway. Why don't we give them tax incentives to allow them to use it while they're alive, income tax free, to pay for this problem, right? That makes sense. We'll just allow it's already going to be paid out tax free. Why not do it now? And what we found was within about five years of someone's life expectancy is when they would need care. So it really wasn't a big burden on the life insurance companies either. It was a win 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 for everybody. So let me show you how it works. So let's say that this is my portfolio. So I might have some moderate, some aggressive, some conservative type asset. And if you ask me, Michelle, how will you pay for long-term care? And I don't already have a plan in place, I actually have two. I would tell you, I'm gonna tap into my conservative bucket of my portfolio because it's money I have quick access to without taking a huge hit. People usually would go after CDs, savings accounts, uh, you know, maybe even life insurance policies because they have quick access to that money. So what the government said is, let's reposition money from one pocket to the other. We're just going to move it around, right? It's still yours. It's still, you still have it. We're just going to move it for tax incentives. But now we've turned this into a larger amount via that death benefit, that life insurance death benefit. But we went one step further, and we've been offering these contracts since the late 80s. We offer lifetime coverage, not just for one person, but if you happen to be a couple, for two people. This was extremely important because we understood the, the longevity that we were starting to face. And we didn't want anybody to question how long they were going to have this paid for. If I'm using care for you know two or three years in a nursing home, I don't want to have to be moved out. Chris, you mentioned it with your grandma. I don't want to have to be moved out and go somewhere else because I ran out of money. That is not going to be an issue here. So what we've really done here is we're carving out, we're carving out a piece of the pot to protect all of it. It's portfolio insurance. It's my plan insurance. It's my strategy. It's my retirement lifestyle. It's everything insurance, because this is by far the most expensive thing that most people will face in their uh, later years. Oh, and by the way, I keep talking about this like it's later on down the line. It's not. For oftentimes what we see is, especially when I say younger people needing care, those in their 30s, 40s, 50s, is because of cancer or an accident or stroke. Oftentimes when I say cancer, that kind of gives people the shivers, but we don't think about, we think of it something we get and then die from, but we forget the battle in between. People need help in between and they can absolutely use these for those. So this isn't just for older folks needing this, this can happen at any time. There's a stoic quote that says, if it can happen, it can happen today. So it can happen at any time. Now. I will tell you, nobody has ever asked me, Michelle, how does this work when I die? I think even most people out there understand how life insurance works. When I die, my family's going to get this larger amount, hopefully larger, and they get it tax-free. But they do always ask me, how does it work if I actually have to use it while I'm alive to pay for my care? So let me show you this next slide. This next slide, if I've had your attention at any point, this is the part I want you to get because you're about to see how powerful this can be. So I'm gonna use a timeline. We all know how timelines work. You start from the left and we're gonna move out to the right over a period of time. So to the left, this is gonna be our life insurance policy. And I'm just gonna make up a number. Let's say it's $250,000.
Okay, it's more than what I had. Two hundred fifty thousand, I could burn through that pretty quickly. So it's going to pay out on a monthly basis. Guess why? Because your long-term care bills come in monthly. So these are going to pay out monthly. That's just how this works. So here would be day one. I'm now needing care. My family's going to call up company and say, hey, you know, Michelle's needing help. We're, we got to get this ball rolling. We're going to start shooting out this, this monthly income to pay these bills. But it can run out. As I mentioned, 250 is more than what I had, but it's still a finite bucket of money. So there's the option I mentioned it a moment ago where we can add on to make sure that I'm covered forever. And by the way, my policies have my spouse on when I'm married. So it does have my spouse on it. So the base policy, let me back up. This base policy is ironclad guaranteed. It's whole life insurance. It has cash value and it's guaranteed to increase. Now, you're not gonna get rich in this. This is not designed to make you rich. It's designed to keep you from becoming poor. And I'll show you some numbers here in just a moment to, to kind of solidify that. So hey, Michelle, I, I got to yeah. stop real quick on one thing. You just hit something so vital. This isn't something that's going to make you rich, but a lot of people don't understand the difference between rich and wealthy. Wealthy folks have figured out how not to give the money back. You just hit that quintessential meaning of wealth because I, I don't know many wealthy people that don't have some form of long-term care because they, they might have all the money in the world to pay for their care. But why would they when they can make the insurance company pay for a fraction of the, the cost and they don't have to give their wealth away? There's a huge difference between rich and wealthy, and you just nailed it. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you. I'm going to double down on that. There's really three reasons why wealthy people do this, uh, in my experience anyway. And we have people that are doing this. They've got 25, 30, 40 million dollars. And I, I had one guy, God, I got to tell the story. So I had one and it was a financial uh, planner. And the client had that kind of money. It was, I think it was about 25 million at the time. And the financial professional was trying to tell him, you don't need insurance, was talking him out of it. And the guy responded back. He said, you don't understand. I don't want to use my money to pay for it. I want to use your money to pay for it. And it was just so profound when I heard him say that. But there's really three reasons why wealthy people do these types of things. Three reasons. Number one is they understand taxation and they understand how to avoid it legally and hopefully, right? So all wealthy, wealthy people, they pay a lot of money to avoid paying, to, to understand that tax code and how to avoid it. Number two, they understand the power of leverage. Leverage is taking your pennies and turn them in, into dollars. If I could buy that million dollar commercial property for 200,000, by golly, I'm going to do it, but I'm not paying a million for it. The number three reason is they always give their money instruction. They always have earmarked buckets. They don't just put everything in one bucket. They have earmarked buckets that they put their money in that is designed for a specific purpose. And that's exactly what I'm showing you here. Avoid taxation, leverage the dollar, and then have a designated bucket for their money. All right, so back to this. So this life insurance policy, it's going to pay out whether you live or die. Last I checked, one of those two things is gonna happen. You're either gonna live on it or you're gonna die. The second part of this, this is optional. You don't have to do this, but you're about to see why everybody does it. This is why I did it. This second piece does not have any, there's no death benefit. There's no cash value there. All that it does is it kicks in as soon as my money's gone and it just keeps paying for however long I or my spouse live needing care. So the second part of this, this is really just like a catastrophic major medical, like what Chris bought for his mom many years ago, catastrophic type policy with a high deductible. I'm going to say that again. It's got a high deductible, a, in this example, $250,000 deductible. Why do I say deductible? Because everybody knows what a deductible is and they understand how it works. When you increase your deductible on your car insurance, what happens to your premium? It gets lower. So if you are going to handle, this is really, remember this base policy, that's your money. So I'm using my money first. I'm just using it in a tax advantaged leveraged way to keep my catastrophic coverage very inexpensive. So I don't doubt that I need major medical health insurance. Like I said, I spent $300,000, <laughs> but I had a $7,000 deductible. Was I happy with that? No, I don't wanna pay seven grand, but man, I didn't wanna pay 300 either. That's why you have the catastrophic major medical. This is the exact same thing. Everybody wants to be covered forever. They just don't wanna pay out the lawsuit for it. I don't even know what a wazoo is, but we're going to go with that. So let me show you some numbers. I'm sure you guys are dying to see what this would actually look like. So there's three ways, there's many ways to pay, but three ways we're going to cover today. 
So first we're gonna talk about stacking with income. This is really, when I say younger, younger in long-term care tends to be 35 to probably 55. So when I say younger, that's what I'm talking about is kind of that age range. And this is what I did personally. So I bought a small policy and then I kept stacking policies on top of it so I could aggregate that all together to get a nice rich benefit. I'll show you that in just a moment. The next one would be savings. We do have, maybe it's parents, maybe it's older folks. When I say older folks, those that are right before retirement and, and maybe later, they've got cash. Cash is sitting at the bank. Why? Oh my gosh. To, so that the bank can loan it out and make money on your money. CDs are paying point squat. Let's put that to good use. So I'm gonna show you how that works. And then last, qualified money. When I say qualified money, what we're talking about is employer-sponsored plans, those that have IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, uh, that money, it has tax advantages when you put it in, but there are no tax advantages when you pull it out. So I'm going to show you what we do with uh, with qualified money. All right, so the first one, so the stacking strategy that I'm going to cover is, you know, most people don't buy all of the life insurance that they'll ever need in their entire life the first time they hear about it. When I'm 35, I don't buy everything. I don't know what I'm going to need in the future, but there also might be other reasons why I can't get it. Maybe... Maybe, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm working on it, but I've got other obligations. I got to pay those down. And then, you know, I kind of build on top of that. So um, here's what we can do with the same concept with um, long-term care. So let's say that I'm age 40. And by the way, there's no rhyme or reason to this. These are two, two folks that are 40. Oh, I meant to tell you. So I said 70% earlier, but if you're a couple, if you one of two people, the chances that one of the two will need care is 91%. If it's a 91% chance that it's going to rain, I'm taking my umbrella, I'm covering. So I just want you to know that if you're a couple, it, it's even worse because one of the two of you will most likely need care. So I'm going to assume this 40-year-old couple. So what they can do is the first thing that they do is just buy a minimal policy. They just get started. $50,000 as a death benefit, the annual premium, $1,351. So we're talking a little over $100 a month. And this is how I started, a little over $100 a month and it will provide $24,000 a year for me tax-free and $24,000 a year for my husband tax-free. And I wish I could I wish I could buy a rental property for 1300 bucks a year and get cash flow of $24,000 a year. I'll buy a lot of those. <laughs> that's a that's a pretty good I, I hate to use return because it's not an investment, but I have access to cash flow if something happens. Will 24,000 pay for my nursing home? No, absolutely not but man, it buys me time. It relieves a lot of pressure. So maybe five years later, my, my first kid graduates from college. Well, I can do another one. I've got the, I got the freed up cash flow. I can buy another one. I'm going to stack that on top of it. I do it again when the second kid uh, graduates from college because I got more cash flow. And then maybe I'll buy the last one at age 55. There's no rhyme or reason. Uh, to four, you could do seven, you could do two. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter the age range. But all of this together, what it got me was $200,000 in death benefit, annual premium of $7,300 that I've, I've, I've kind of stacked over a period of time, but it's creating $96,000 a year for ever income tax free. Again, I like rental real estate. If I could buy properties that gave me $96,000 a year for myself and my spouse with cash flow, and then I have a guaranteed sale of $200,000 when, when I die, I mean, I would do that all day. I absolutely would do that all day. I love so let me that. Stop I, right there. What do you think about I've that? Never, Michelle, I've never seen anybody do it that way. I've never seen anybody teach a stacking strategy. I mean, people ladder CDs. I mean, with the IBC stuff that we do, the infinite banking concept, we're opening multiple branch offices, multiple policies. I have never seen that in all the years that I've been doing this. So that is awesome. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I, I kind of developed this because I was wanting to buy it for myself. And I bought my first policy when I was 38. And I just thought about it. Why would I try to buy everything that I will need in the future? And oftentimes, maybe it's unaffordable at that moment because I have other obligations, paying down debt, whatever it may be, funding college, all that kind of stuff. So this just allowed me to do things over a period of time. And also, you know, back in the day, long-term care was really only talked about to those that were you know, 55, 60 years old and older. But we've seen a, a, a change uh, because we're seeing this impact younger and younger folks. So thanks, Chris. All right, so now I'm gonna to move to savings. And I know this might shock you, but there are people that have hundreds of thousands of dollars just sitting in bank accounts and they just have it there for their safety or their emergency fund. 
So I'm gonna show you this, the power of this and, and what can be done. So this would be for a couple of 60 year olds. So maybe it's your parents, maybe it's people on this call, maybe it's your loved ones. So this is someone that has $150,000 in the bank and you ask them, gosh, um, what are you gonna use that for? Well, if something bad happens, they're not talking about their refrigerator breaking, they're talking about medical, especially the older we get, that's what we're really looking at. So in this case, what they did is they repositioned this and moved it again from one pocket to the other. And what we're going to do is we're gonna create a $165,000 death benefit. That's not why we're doing this. That's just an added benefit. What we're doing is we're gonna create almost $80,000 a year on that 150 guaranteed income tax-free forever. That would be the equivalent to earning 53% year over year guaranteed. So if I took 150 at 53% every year, that would create 79,000. You'd have to double that to make sure that both people were getting that paid out. That is the power of LTC income insurance. <laughs> that is what we're talking about. It's leveraging money. It's making your pennies work like dollars. Uh, and by the way, let me do some quick math here. I've got a, so oftentimes we hear, you know, 5% would be a good rate. 5% would be a good rate. So I'm going to take 79,000. I'm going to divide that by 5%. That means I would have to have $1.58 million setting aside, earning 5% every single year to generate what I'm able to do for 150. Would you rather set aside 150 or would you rather set aside 1.58? Math is irrefutable. <laughs> this is a, as good as it gets, everything's guaranteed, and it's been happening since the late 80s. What do you think about that, Chris? Yeah, I love that. And, and this is probably one of my most, like my favorite things, you know, with how you guys present this and how you guys use this is with using existing savings or existing assets to kind of go in and create these vehicles. Because back in the day with the long-term care stuff, the only way we could do that is take money from a savings or money from a qualified plan, move it into an immediate annuity, and then have that fund the long-term care. This is so much more efficient. So much more efficient. You're absolutely correct. And covering two people, I don't know if it's going to be my husband. He doesn't know if it's me. I'm pretty sure he thinks it's me, but I, I think it'll be him first, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Now, lastly, I want to talk about IRAs and we're just, I'm just going to show some numbers here uh, and I'm going to keep it simple here. Again, when we talk about qualified assets, what we're talking about is IRAs, 401ks, 403bs. So we're talking about pre-tax dollars. The government is not generous with this money. They are, they might not know where they spend their money, but they know if you spend money out of qualified accounts, they're going to tax it. So here's um, what I would say. If you have uh, any of these, if you have excess qualified dollars, uh, you've inherited wealth from a loved one. We have a lot of people that are starting to inherit because the baby boomer saved and they have IRAs and they're starting to inherit these IRAs and they don't really know what they can do with it. But the government does require them to pay taxes on that. You can't just take that money over and not pay taxes. You got to pay it over, over a 10-year period now. You do have a desire to pass assets to future generations. You're considering a Roth conversion. And you're concerned about future needs or extended health care. So this is how it would work. This is, a, this is probably my favorite option out there. So if I have $150,000 sitting in my portfolio, it's IRA, 401k, 403b, whatever it may be, I can reposition it move it from one pocket to the other. Nothing's taxable. I'm just going to move it from one product to another. But what, I, what I've done by moving this is I'm adding a premium bonus, another 37,500 on top of that, just for moving it. And now what I've done is I've turned that into 187,500. Now 187,500, remember, we still have to pay taxes on this, but we're not gonna pay taxes on the whole amount right away we're gonna spread that tax hit out over a 10 year period. So we're gonna take 10 equal distributions out. So we're gonna spread out that tax hit so it doesn't throw us in a higher tax bracket. We can do some tax planning with that. It's kind of like a Roth conversion for those of you that are familiar with that. We're just kind of moving this over to something that is tax-free and definitely tax-free for care. So in this example, I'm gonna show you those same two 60 year olds with this qualified money of 187.5. So we're gonna move this money over by doing this, what we've done is we have created $72,000 a year each. Oh, by the way, let's say this was his qualified money. We can add the spouse to his qualified account. Now they both have access. That's a big deal. And now we've created $72,000 a year each income tax free for both for the rest of their lives. They don't have to worry about this. That would be the equivalent to earning 48% on that 187.5 year over year guaranteed. 
or actually it's on the 150. I didn't even factor in the bonus. 48% is on the 150. This is a powerful option because there's a lot of people out there that have qualified money and they don't really know what to do with it or they're inheriting it. So keep this in the back of your mind as well. All right, so we're gonna start wrapping up. You are only one choice away from changing your life and those that are around you. So my, my ask here is, Remember those two questions that I asked you. And, and I, I had a pastor when I was growing up one time. He said, you can't open this book, read it, shut it, and pretend like you didn't read what you just read. So Chris and I kind of tricked you. Now you know that there's options out there. So now you have to make a conscious decision to do something or not. So I, you know, I don't know, Chris, if you have any questions or if you want to discuss this a little bit more or just give general thoughts. Well, yeah. And folks, as you guys are all kind of, processing all this, put your questions in the Q&A. Let's get as many questions as we can answered because I'm sure there's a lot of them I have questions. First off, I didn't know about that 25% bonus. I mean, I knew about this product. I, I knew quite a few things, but this isn't my area of expertise. So that's really interesting. Now, can I just ask a question about the, the distributions from the retirement accounts? So we're going to take, we're going to spread it out and take 10 distributions. But what if it's me? I'm 46, so I'm not 59 and a half. How does that work? Do I have to pay that 10% IRS penalty? Yes, you would. So here's there's a couple of things. If you had inherited it, then you don't have to pay that 10% penalty. You will have to spread that tax it out because the government requires inherited IRAs to be paid out over a period of time. So that's a way to avoid that tax hit. But if you I currently see. have the IRA or the 401k or 403b and you take that out, you would have to pay. Um, you would have to pay that ten percent penalty on that. But anyone over fifty nine and a half, that would be a sweet spot. That's a real sweet spot, absolutely. Because then you don't have to pay that ten percent penalty. Love it. There was a question in the the Q and A that the, I didn't know how to answer. Sure. So if I can uh, if I can throw this one over to you, yeah, and let sure. me change up the view here. So this was from Anonymous, and they said, "Can this be used to supplement SS?" Or is this to replace that? So I'm not really sure what MCR is. I'm not sure what MCR is either. So Anonymous, if you could just you know put up another post, you can do it in the chat or in the Q and A. Uh, just what is MCR? So some, you know I don't really quite understand. I would assume SS is Social Security, and this definitely isn't replacing Social Security. But the good news is. Oh, Medicare. The government keeps running Social Security the way it is. Actually, if you look at your statement, it's going to run out of money anyway. So you don't really need to worry too much about Social Security. The government's going to take care of that for you because it's going to be bankrupt. But then they'll That's just right. print more money. And, you know, anyway, we know that story. So they tend to. So it can. So they're asking about Medicare. So when we're talking about oftentimes we have found that people might break a hip and they have that rehabilitation, but most likely they're not coming out. Sometimes when people break hips, they stay in and they, they don't come back home. My grandmother had a stroke. She did not come back home. She went into the Medicare part of the facility. And then, um, so the, the, the prorated days, that would count toward that. But there's also, depending on the type of coverage that you have, there are usually um, elimination days um, so it's zero days for us. It's zero days for home health care. It's 90 days for any other care. So you'd have to pay the first 90 days out of pocket. But it really depends on the company and it depends on the product that you purchased. But if they are in that 100 days, let's say, you know, they're in that 20 to 100 days where it's prorated with Medicare, you can absolutely, if they qualify, remember, they still have to qualify for government uh, tax advantages. So they have to qualify by failing two of six ADLs. So if they are receiving, you know, they, they're in a wheelchair, that would be one ADL. And let's say they're not able to get dressed, that would be two ADLs, activities of daily living. So now they've satisfied those federal requirements in order to get this money tax-free. They're still receiving Medicare. This could pay some of that prorated day. But if it's a if it's a 90 day, I mean, we're talking about the last 10 days. So it's it's really different kinds of different kinds of care. Awesome. Yeah. MCR. I should have known Medicare reimbursement. <laughs> uh, you know, I got IBC on the brain and that's about the only <laughs> three letters I know anymore. So uh, Marcy said, why is there a 25% increase if you take monies out of a qualified account? So it's with this particular product. So what happens is when you move that over, you're just moving like to like. So you'd move a hundred thousand over to a hundred thousand, you'd say. So in this particular case, it doesn't pay an ongoing interest rate. So the 25% is really all of the interest up front. 
So uh-huh. that's what they're doing by a premium. They're just giving you all of that interest earnings. And then they take that amount and they divide it by 10 so that it's equal because you, the way that the product works, you can't have the fluctuations because it, it the distribution is going to be the exact same amount for the premium. I'm trying to find an easy way to explain that. So the distribution amount will match the premium exactly. So we just give you all the money up front, that 25% bonus, and then spread it out over 10 years. And and Marianne uh, said in the chat, is there a minimum amount to, that one can move from an IRA? There is. It used to be, I think it's a minimum face amount now. So it used to be a $20,000 move. I believe it's a, a minimum $50,000 death benefit. So whatever the premium amount, I can check on that, Chris. I'll get that for you. But I'm okay. pretty sure that it's the death benefit that drives it now. So whatever that minimum amount to to get to that fifty thousand would be the uh, the the correct amount. Perfect. And then Dexter said, "I assume to get a long term care policy, even if you're already a client with One America, you need to get a current physical." It depends. So it depends okay. on a couple of things. So how much risk you already have with One America. So if you already have uh, and include a new policy that you had paid for $250,000 or more, then you would have to have another another physical. If you are under the age of 60, it would just be like your normal physical. Um, If you are over the age of 60, we do a cognitive screening where they'll ask you some questions, really testing your memory. Uh, What'd you have for breakfast? Would you, you know, who's the president? How old are you? What's Sometimes they'll ask, you know, if the big hand is on the 12 and the small hand's on the three, what time is it? They ask these things because folks that have cognitive issues can't answer those questions. So they sound really minor. I've had so many people get mad when they're asked these questions because they're like, that's a stupid question. Just answer it. There's a reason for it. They use, um, I can't remember what it's called, but there's Mm -hmm. a medical test in the medical community that they use these kind of questions in the same, uh, in the same order. Uh, and it's it's pretty renowned in the medical industry. So that's what they use. They just ask memory questions. Hey, Dex, when you're on, on the call, if you need a little help, just dial me up and then like, you know, I'll hear their questions and I'll just feed you the answers in case you don't know what the three and the, the 12 is. I got you. <laughs> I buddy. always tell people, I'm like, look, well, don't joke with these people. They're not, they're not funny. Underwriters aren't funny. Like, don't say I left my keys in the refrigerator. Like, don't say that. Just <laughs> They are not funny. We sat they with are. an underwriter at, a, at one of the uh, awards dinners and yeah, I was trying to be funny. It took better part of an hour just to get a laugh out of the underwriter. I'm like, man, you guys are really pent up (laughs) anyway christine uh what's up christine she said can the move from a traditional to a roth be more than 10 years do you say not paying tax on moving it how so i don't know if you if you can read that one okay so i mean a roth conversion you there's many different you don't have to do it over 10 years so that could be done over two years you can just cash that because really what you're doing is you're cashing it in you're paying the taxes and you're moving it over to a roth and of course there's roth rules that we won't cover today. Uh, ages, income, things like that. Roth rollovers, you have more freedom that you can do than if you bought one outright. Um, so what was the second part of that question? Forgive me. I said, do you say not paying tax on moving it how? I see. So it, it's just called a, a rollover or a direct transfer. So what you're doing when you move it from one institution or one company to another company where they're taking control over that money, you really haven't, you haven't cashed that in. So that's a trustee to trustee transfer. That would be tax. I don't want to say tax free. It's not taxable just by moving that from one company to another. It's not until you actually take a distribution from it, you pull money out of it and you take possession that you're going to pay taxes on that. Perfect. All right. King Cat said, I missed the screen. Is it or does it say 1500 per 1500 a year per $50,000 plan? if I were to buy a plan for my 64 year old mother? It depends on the age. So what I was showing there was based on 40 year olds or 45, 50, 55. I just gave some examples. Uh, there's just no way that I could have put every age range or you know, female or, or male. Um, so it really depends on their age so we, and their gender. So we would, have to, we would have to actually run those numbers for 64. Yeah, I think what you should do is just book a call with Mike and have him run the numbers for your mom and just kind of look at what that would look like. That's the best way to do it. It's super easy. And uh, Mike, you know, has his uh, his link there. So just click the link and book a call with him. And it also depends on the state that you're in. Um, in California, for those, I don't know if you have Californians on this call, it's a little bit different. The options, well, California is a little bit different, but the options also 
are a little bit different. Uh, so it just depends on the state that you're in. So. Brent says, if my employer has a government-backed IRA style savings, so maybe like a 457 plan or a pension, I'm not really sure what, what that is. We can get into that with a phone call. Uh, would it be smart to pull my money from that to help fund my IBC and one of these, or should I leave it? So Brent, there's a lot of factors and a lot of things that play into that decision. Uh, number one, your age. Number two, does your plan even allow the, the distributions to be taken from the plan? So there's a lot of things that, that maybe would probably take a whole nother 30 minutes of this webinar to explain. But Brent, I think the best thing to do, just book a call with us and we can kind of run through your scenario, get a little bit more familiar with what type of retirement plan, government-backed retirement plan that is, and then we could give you the proper advice on what to do or what not to do with that. A lot of times it does not make sense to take money from a, a qualified retirement plan and put it into IBC, but that would be a different story for this because moving it to this is a different ball of wax than moving it to an IBC policy. So I would say, again, I'm not trying to push you off or get you to book a call, but I think that's going to be your best avenue here. And, and I'll add one thing. It depends on employer to employer, their administration and how they, what they will allow and what they won't if you're still currently employed. So yeah, I would also recommend that you have a personal conversation um, because it, it really just depends. Okay. And then Sam said, how do I learn more about what you have described? Oh, Mike. I would just be booking a call with Mike. That's right. Mike, you want to put your, uh, well, Brand I think Brandon's putting it up. So Sam, we'll put it up in the chat real quick. Just copy and paste the link and then click it. And then it'll have all the times available and just book a call with, with Mike and you kind of go over your particular situation. You know, and I know Michelle did some really, really good case studies and some good examples, but your scenario might be very different and unique to you. So we want to look at your individual needs, goals, and situation, and that would be the best way to do it. So just book that call. Oh, oh Brent, sorry. Uh, I should have read this one before I read the last one, Roth style savings. So, all right. So now that's different, Brent. I'm sorry. Forget everything I just said in the prior one about the government styled retirement. Now, if you've got yourself a Roth and you've had that Roth for five years, now we're talking about something totally different because a Roth after five years, you could take the money out tax free. So that that's a totally different ball of wax for IBC and definitely very, very much so would work well with what Michelle just presented with Asset Care. So I, I'm still gonna tell you to book a call so that we can kind of go over specifics about it. But yes, so forget everything I said before. Now that you're talking about a Roth, we don't have to worry about any of those, those pesky taxes on it as long as you're past that five year period of time. So I think uh, I think you're in the ball game now. Mark said, is Brian, is Brian Shea still affiliated with this program? You know, I don't know, Michelle, do you? I haven't talked to Brian Shea in quite some time, I'm not sure. Me either. I'm not sure either, Mark, uh, but Michelle is, so there you go, and so is Mike. But uh, Mark, I think, like I had mentioned earlier in one of them, I think booking a call with Mike to review what you already set up with Brian would be a great idea. I just haven't heard from Brian in a long time. All right, Mark, what's happening? Uh, just to clarify, the scenario we were discussing is only for moving money from a qualified retirement account What's an alternative uh, scenario for those of us with none? Yeah, actually, Michelle, you did such a good job explaining the retirement stuff, but like people can just fund it on a monthly basis or an annual basis, right? Yeah, that's what I do. So I fund mine annually and there's extra tax incentives I didn't get into, such as uh, using an HSA, which is what I do for my writer. Uh, you can't get uh, extra tax incentives on the life insurance because we still want it to have the tax advantages when it gets paid out. Um, but I use my HSA, also depending on ages, if you have an LLC, there's some tax deductibility there. Um, but there's a lot of people that choose to just pay this out of pocket over a period of time and leave the IRA part out. So that's right. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, Michelle, they're very underutilized from a tax planning standpoint. But I know my CPA is always on me about opening up an HSA. So mm -hmm. this would qualify, right? So you could use funds in an HSA to fund your long-term care premium? You can. There's going to be age-related caps. So now I am at the age where I don't have a cap. <laughs> so right. I'm, I'm there. Uh, I'll be 48 this year. So um, I use my um, my writer for my husband and I. I just use my HSA and I write a check out of my HSA to pay for it. Um, but can... yeah, in the earlier days, it was just a, a, a large portion of it. And then I would still have to pay out of pocket. But they publish those. You can just look it up on a website. Um, I could probably pull it up. 
uh, what they are because they change every year. They increase a little bit every year, um, but it's just um, the the age. It, it's um, the age related for long term care. What's tax deductible is the same for HSAs. Wow, that's phenomenal too. That's another strategy I haven't really heard mentioned often. But the HSA, the health savings account, gives you tax deductibility up to the certain limit. And because this is a qualified you know expense, you can use your HSA money for. Now you can start playing some some serious tax planning. Consult with your CPA on that. We can't give you tax advice. All right, Mark said, can you, oh, this is a good one. Can you do a 1035 exchange toward one of these long-term care policies? Absolutely. However, there's always a however. Uh, it's gotta be like to like. So if it's a single person, so if you bought the policy on yourself, we cannot do a 1035 exchange to a joint policy covering you and a spouse. So it'd have to be you to you, or if it was a joint policy back in the day, as you know, Chris, a lot of people bought second to die life insurance policies for estate planning purposes. If you had one of those, then we could do a 1035 exchange into this. Yeah, I hate to say it, but I think those second to die policies are gonna become really popular here soon with the yeah, sunset gonna... of these tax laws, but let's Absolutely. hope I'm wrong. Let's hope I'm wrong. I, d I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> I hear you. All right, Rick said, is there a replay of this that I can share with my wife? Smart man, right, Rick, smart man. Yes, there will be. So this will be edited and, and it's already been recorded. It'll be edited and then it'll be put up on my YouTube channel. So as long as you're subscribed to at the Chris Noggle, this will show up there. And then I'm also going to see about doing a little something else. I'm going to see about sending this out to everybody who registered for this webinar, just so it's directly sent to you. Um, I don't want to you know, put words in Shauna's mouth because she's the one that would decide how difficult that is. But we're going to try to do that. If not, just go to my YouTube channel and it'll be up there. And the final question, Gregory said, are we able to go back and review this video? So refer back to what I just said a second ago, YouTube video or YouTube channel at the Chris Noggle, just subscribe, it'll be up on there. And if possible, and if you're really nice to Shauna, maybe she'll send it out to everybody that registered for this webinar. And oh yeah, let us. So part of our team, uh, at, many of you know Linus from the application team, but he asked, is there a minimum insured age and what does underwriting look like for me to get a policy on my parents? Like, do they have to know? Okay, so they would have to know. We can't buy insurance on people that don't know. Uh, it would be difficult to buy uh, life insurance on a parent just for the sake of doing it. My husband and I did it uh, because he has a special needs sister, so we paid for it, but underwriting wanted to know why. What's the financial risk if your mom died? So it was, it was kind of difficult. When it comes to long-term care, they understand what the risk is to... Uh, to folks. So it's a non-issue. Uh, you can absolutely buy long-term care insurance for your parents. The lowest age that we can go is 35. We can go up to age 80 with life insurance. If it's an annuity, which is a whole nother story, we can go up to the age of 87. There's tax advantages there as well. I'm always learning, Linus. I went online to One America's site and there was a, a sample PowerPoint presentation that said issue age 20 to 80. So I gave him bad information. I'm glad you clarified that. And then uh, Rich said, what about the bonus when we registered? So Rich, what what was the, refresh my memory in the chat. If there was a bonus you got for registering for this, we'll definitely make sure you get that delivered. And, and forgive me for not knowing, we do so many of these, I don't know what they were giving you, but we love to give stuff away for free. So we'll make sure you get that. So Rich, in, in the Q&A, just send me your email and then I'll make sure to get that over to Shauna and whatever it is the bonus was, you'll get that as well said it my our, your process well whatever it is listen happy to give it to you uh deck said how many people have already ordered the red white oh yeah sorry michelle totally off topic but dex uh is one of the the rare ones that actually went online we put a limited edition usa shirt that we just made it is a red white and blue byob shirt and we did that uh you know to basically give thanks to all of our veterans, all of our, our military, our first responders, and everybody that makes America great and protects the freedom that we have today. So thank you to all of you. And for that, we made a special red, white, and blue shirt. And Dex wants an extra large blue long sleeve shirt one. All right. Rich, I'm going to copy that uh, email and I will make sure I get you whatever that was. Perfect. And with that Chris, being... I did just receive an answer that with the qualified money, it's a $50,000 life insurance death benefit. Amount. So whatever awesome. the amount is to fund that, that would be the minimum. Awesome.
All right, folks. So that about wraps up tonight's webinar. Michelle, thank you so much. That was phenomenal. I mean, honestly, like I was sitting there learning things that I, I should have known, but hey, listen, just the way you presented it just made it so easy to understand. And hopefully all of you learned something. Hopefully, hopefully all of you that are interested in learning more about your individual situation, whether it's you, a spouse, or your parents, like I did for my mom, then make sure you book a call with Mike. We'll put his link up one more time. Just click the button, pick a time, and that's all there is to it. Like I said, we're recording this and we're gonna be editing and putting this up on YouTube and we'll do our best to get this emailed out to each one of you. But thank you all so much for your time tonight. It was an honor and a privilege to be able to serve each and every single one of you. Thanks and have a good night.